I'm going to be very brief. Um, I, I have some questions for, for Ravi at the end, so I want to make sure that I leave, I leave time for him to, to answer those. Also, Marcus and I came from the same meeting in Berlin this week, and um, I think our, our thinking has, has been shaped in slightly similar directions, and Marcus has some very specific things to say, so I also want to leave time for him. Okay. So... Okay, should I stand here? Let me move this. Is that better? So very broadly, what did we talk about in this session? We talked about the fact that we need more data, we need better data, and we need new theory. Okay, that's not exactly, um, that's rather too broad brush. That would apply pretty much to any session we could be in. So I want to talk very briefly about, about the WID data. Um, I think you and your wider needs to be congratulated on, on, on the production of this, this amazing data set. Uh, it's highly transparent, it's very well documented. One does know exactly where the data is coming from, um, and very importantly, there's no imputation. So unlike with the SWID data, where one appears to have data, uh, but, it, uh, but a lot of that data is in fact generated uh, by the database rather than coming from, uh, from an original data source. Having said that, of course, Kathleen Beagle yesterday in the, in the session on, on Africa made this point that data is still fraught. Even if you've done as much as you possibly can in the office to try and harmonize that data, the fact is that what comes from the original statistical agency is not necessarily the same. Um, these data sets all use very different, well, somewhat different survey methodologies. Mm -hmm. They have different reference periods for consumption across different, uh, different types of surveys. There are very different sampling methodologies. The, the data producers themselves tend to truncate the data. They deflate in different ways. Um, and and one, one can't entirely address those issues when you get the data after the fact. So I do think that we need to see more collective action globally on, on standardizing how survey methodology happens. And I think there have been massive movements in that direction, uh, within, certainly within the EU and within the OECD countries. But for the developing countries, I, th I think beyond the, the massive efforts of, of, of the World Bank, we haven't, seen, we haven't seen that much push towards getting stats agencies to, to do things in a consistent way. I think where, where we're moving to is, is towards saying, well, survey data takes us part of the way. Um, but actually, most countries now have an increasing push to make, make available administrative data as well. And so I think where the frontier now is, is in terms of trying to say, how do we combine these two things? If we have survey data for most of the distribution, but we know that the survey data is probably missing at the top end of the distribution, are there good ways in which we can combine that uh, with administrative records? So both of these data sources have their own issues. Um, tax register data has, uh, has some missing records, either because of tax evasion or because taxes are only collected, of course, for a, for a small proportion of the population. The household surveys have problems of unit non-response and, and potentially inaccurate information. So the, even if we have both data sources in a country, I think combining those data sets is, is, is quite a fraught exercise. I want to very quickly show you one slide, or two slides for South Africa. So this is South African data, where we use a household survey, which is the, the, blue, um, the blue line, and we use tax record data, uh, which is the red line, just for the very top end of the distribution. So these are the richest 8% of adults in South Africa. Uh, and we see that there's, there's quite some similarity between those two distributions, which seems quite comforting. Uh, when we look at that in, in, in detail, we find that even within that small part of the distribution, there's quite a lot of consistency uh, in the two data sets, except right at the top of the distribution. So that's, that seems like a, a, a very plausible story. One doesn't expect to find the very richest uh, households participating in the household survey, so one might then think, well, this is, this is excellent. We've got tax register data for the very top, We've got household survey data for, for everybody else. So even in a situation like that where you've got quite a lot of consistency between the data, you still have a whole lot of issues to address in terms of at what, at what point of the distribution would you try and join these two distributions? 
um, and 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 how do you deal with with the inconsistencies? And so I I guess I'm 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 wondering a bit about what one then does even if one has this type of data. How would a how would a database like would ever try and and incorporate data that that is in some sense synthetic? Uh, and and so I think as we move towards the, uh, a situation where more and more countries are producing uh, these types of data, one needs to think hard about how one how one might standardize methodologies. Uh, I'm out of time, so I'm going to pose one question to, to, to Ravi, because I don't think he, he spoke for nearly long enough. Um, our, the, the chair already asked him a question about inequality of opportunity. I had a, another question for him. So we've heard that we need more empirics, okay? So we need to understand better what is the nature of inequality, we need to understand better the, the drivers of inequality, and then, as Ravi said, we need much more theory to try and 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 fit to those to, to, the, to those empirics. And um, something that was very hot in, in in yesterday's business press was this new new work by uh, by Charles Goodhart, who's the former chief economist for the Bank of England, who said the Piketty thesis is uh, is 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 dead. Uh, Piketty is is history uh, on the basis that. Demographic change is is going to make a massive difference in 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 the, in the future. So he makes this argument that the global labour force um, is 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 no longer going to continue to grow nearly so fast. Uh, that therefore the returns to labour are likely to likely to rise rapidly, and therefore we are in a very different world. And um, I'd I'd love to hear Ravi's Ravi's response to that. So in, to sort of caric caricature it, he's saying we've been worrying that the robots are taking over, are going to take all the jobs. Maybe we should be worrying instead that um, that the robots aren't taking the jobs nearly fast enough. So that's my rather difficult question to Ravi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> professor Ingrid Ullard is professor in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town and research principal research officer of the Southern African Labor and Development Research Unit. She has been studying a lot on the National Income Dynamics Study. Uh, thank you for complementing uh, our presentation. Now I would like to invite Professor Marcos Genti um, to be short. There we are. Um, since it's me standing between um, you and lunch and possibly a couple of questions from the audience, I'm going to be extremely brief in my remarks. I did prepare a few sets of comments on, on each of the papers, but in fact I'm going to skip those and go directly to two issues which um, relate to both uh, Fintarp and Joko Pirtilas and, and Ravi's discussion. So Ravi, in the text I, I got ahead of, the, ahead of the conference, there's an interesting discussion about about the impact of family background on, on economic outcomes and how that might affect inequality. And Ravi touched on, on, on the issue of, of the formal equality of opportunity approaches developed by people like John Romer. Now, one of the interesting things, it, it used to be believed in, in, in a text very well formulated by Milton Friedman in the 1950s that essentially that if you have more inequality in the cross section, you're going to have more dynamism in the economy and consequently you'll observe more mobility um, in the economy. It turns out that once people started looking at intergenerational mobility uh, across countries, the opposite turned out to be be the case. There's this notion of the Great Gatsby curve as formulated by Alan Kruger at the time. The, um, uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors in the U.S., which essentially argues, based in both on economic theory and on, on empirical observation, that, that you're going to observe more intergenerational mobility if you have um, less inequality in, in a country. It turns out also that even if, if I think Ravi's reservations about equality of opportunity can be quite well founded if you look at the correlation between intergenerational um, persistence and equality of opportunity. You find the same kind of thing. The, the countries with a lot of equality of opportunity are the ones with quite equal outcomes in the cross section. They're also the ones with with not so much intergenerational persistence. So these things may all be, in fact, the, these kinds of good things may all be positive, positively correlated with each other. Now, from this, of course, it flows that in the Western world, where inequality has been on the increase in the past years, in the uh, among most OECD countries. Um, 
if we do indeed value equality of opportunity, things like being, having outcomes being less dependent on your family background, we're going to see less of these good things as inequality increases. Whether or not that's true is anybody's guess, but economic theory seems to support it, empirics seems to support it, and most people when queried um, say they support equality of opportunity, so this um, may be a, um, one of the reasons we, we should be worried about inequality. Of course, once you explain to people what e equality of opportunity actually means, uh, that support tends to evaporate, but, but that's uh, then a, a completely separate matter. So I think, uh, but, but I do think we're in dire need to know more about both equality of opportunity and uh, the importance of family background for economic persistence, this despite the fact that, that say, the World Bank with Chico Ferreira and, and, and others before have done an admirable work in, in finding these things out. But, but many of these things we could very easily find out a lot more about in surveys as long as we're actually interested in, in finding them. So, so th that about the equality of opportunity. Another one of these kind of, I think, old ideas which are well worth discussing is, is Arthur Oaken's Great Trade-Off. It's a wonderful book, well worth reading 40 years after the fact it was written, uh, where Arthur Oaken, I think, I think it's frequently misunderstood what he actually was, was trying to say. He wasn't saying that there's this terrible trade-off that, that, that if you want growth, you have to give away equality. That's, in fact, quite different from what he said. What he said was that if there is such a trade-off, we need to realize that, that we want both more equity and we want more, more growth. And then we need to kind of make a decision about how much we want to trade off of the one against the other. His solution was definitely not to abandon e equity um, and, and take all the growth he can. Now, as a consequence of, of the kinds of things Joe Stiglitz was talking about today, um, we now know that, that this trade off may look quite different and in many cases there is no such trade off. It then follows that those who, who say that focusing on distribution is some kind of luxury we can afford once we've gotten sufficient amounts of growth really should think things through again. And, and in fact, this is one of the reasons I think Oaken's book is, is clearly well worth reading still because Arthur Oaken was a macroeconomist who, who really took equ equity quite seriously but was worried about this leaky bucket. It turns out that in many cases the bucket doesn't leak at all. So, so the people who still believe this should, should probably update their beliefs in, in, in view of, of what the world actually looks like. Thank you so much. We did talk, uh, I, I think we did talk uh, many uh, different aspects of uh, inequality, um, mostly from the point of uh, macroeconomics. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Kambura, a little bit to add from your observation on this uh, discussion. Okay, well, let me, uh, uh, perhaps I can respond quickly to uh, the points that uh, uh, Marcus and uh, Ingrid uh, um, uh, raised. Um, on, uh, on inequality of opportunity, I think my, my concern has really been uh, that it should not be it should not be used as actually a device for standing in the way of progressive redistribution policies because the moment you move to redistribute the argument is made you're violating the inequality equal, uh, of opportunity because this income was justly earned by their own efforts etc cetera, etc cetera. Okay, i think that's my big big concern in this regard and so when we have a philosophical structure which separates out circumstance from effort uh, and then we have an empirical effort to separate those two out, which, and both of which, are, as, I, as I argue, are, uh, are really very, uh, very dicey things to, uh, to do. And then we use the, the, uh, the motherhood and apple pie notion of, uh, of the phrase, equality of opportunity. You know, because when you start talking about, uh, if, if, you, if you go into a policy discussion and start talking about redistribution per se, say, oh, you're a dangerous, <laughs> dangerous lefty, but you say, no, well, I'm for equality of opportunity, oh, please come in, let's, let's discuss, and so on. And we very happily go into the room, but then when the door shuts behind you, you realize that actually the ticket on which you came in, the other person has something very different in mind. And you say, well, no, I want, what I want to do is to redistribute parental income because we know that that's one of the main determinants, let's say, of, children, of children's test scores and outcomes, et cetera. 
No, 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 <laughs> that's not what I had in mind, because to do that would be to violate equality of opportunity, that the effort doctrine uh, of the parent. So that's been my, my policy concern, uh, leaving to one side the conceptual difficulties and the, imp and the econometric empirical difficulties, I think. Uh, let me make one other observation uh, on uh, separation of efficiency and equity. Again, this is a, a very deep-seated uh, trait in economists. I mean, it's a, uh, I, I don't know if the, some of you remember, maybe Joe remembers, uh, James Mead's tract, uh, The Intelligent Radical's Guide uh, to, uh, to Economics. Okay? It was actually uh, self-consciously uh, sort of a, uh, reflecting uh, George Bernard Shaw's uh, track, the, the, the Thinking Woman's Guide to, uh, uh, to Socialism and so on. So he said, uh, what's the, intelli the intelligent, the, the radical part of the intelligent radical is that the person is concerned about distribution. But James Meade said was that the intelligent part is that the intelligent radical will not use uh, market mechanisms, uh, interfere, rather will not interfere with market mechanisms, with the pricing mechanisms to get at those objectives. So you get the classic sort of thing, you have property redistribution, uh, but marginal cost pricing. <laughs> okay? It's those twin things, and you have, the, you have a, a separation of equity from efficiency. So it's not, just, it's not just separation in that sense, but in terms of policy instruments, that this set of policy instruments are targeted towards that, and that set of policy instruments are targeted towards that. And I think it's that separation, which is, which is very deep in our, in our, in our training, which has actually been questioned by the, by the developments of the last, of the last uh, 20, uh, 30 years. Thank you for very interesting response and analysis. I think uh, we still are at odds, uh, in a way, by habit or by training or by preoccupation that the suspicion still exists. I'm sorry to say that this is suspicion that uh, redistribution or fiscal policy can uh, really help the inequality. But I think that at the same time, the opportunity, inequality of opportunity, is, has some different aspects. Philosophically or economically, it, it needs to be uh, analyzed in more detail with the scientific data. Anyway, I would like to invite questions from the audience. Uh, I hope someone would uh, raise the not only inequality question in, within OECD and developing countries from a macroeconomic point of view, but also um, extreme poverty and poverty related to inequality in developing countries. Please. Please uh, introduce your uh, name and, uh, properly and uh, make a question. Um, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Jim Davies. I'm from the University of Western Ontario. Uh, one thing that's next in inequality is climate change. In fact, it's already upon us. Uh, just a couple of relevant examples here. Uh, Ravi was uh, talking about the stability of uh, inequality in the MENA area. Uh, uh, one thing that's been suggested to me actually by colleagues in other disciplines, uh, climate people, uh, is that uh, there was an increase in food prices uh, leading in the period leading up to the Arab Spring, and that uh, that uh, fueled the discontent and led to uh, you know, some of the uh, political activity at that time. Uh, so I don't know whether that's absolutely true or not, but it suggests that uh, we need to uh, think about what's happening to prices for people at different levels of the income distribution, and clearly, if there's a surge in food prices, the real income of the poor is going down, and there's a systematic change in income distribution, which we don't capture if we don't have uh, adjust for those price changes. The other thing I would mention is, um, uh, here's a plug for some of my own work. Um, together with John Wally and Xiaoyan Shi, uh, had an article in Journal of Economic Inequality last year about uh, the interaction between uh, carbon tax and inequality. Um, if you use the revenue from a worldwide carbon tax, you could have an enormous impact in, and redistribute it, you could have an enormous impact in reducing inequality. That might seem like pie in the sky, but actually something, this is an issue that does need to be addressed because within each country, there's a lot of empirical evidence that shows that carbon tax is regressive. So something has to be done to offset the re regressive effects. We need the carbon tax in order to you know, save the planet. Uh, <laughs> You can't escape that, and it has distribution. Because we, we need uh, other quest questions, so please make your question short. Oh, I'm all done. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, your question must be addressed to uh, Professor Kambu, right? Everybody. Everybody? Can take some yeah. And please. Uh, I'm Andrea Cornia from the University of Florence and formerly at WIDE. Uh, I have two very quick questions. Now, one is for Ravi. When Ravi commented the, the trends, and uh, I praise him for pointing out that uh, Thomas Piketty uh, basically talks about the OECD countries, it looked like that you were attributing the changes in the patterns, I mean, the rise and the falls, uh, basically to Kuznets. And, uh, and my argument would be, well, it is important to try to separate what is due to sort of endogenous factors, like China is uh, exhausting its labor reserve, and so wages are rising, and therefore, blah, 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 blah. And to what is basically driven by policy. Now, in Latin America, the decline is there's been no changes in the labor reserve, and then basically the decline has been due to a massive increase in uh, expenditure on secondary education and on redistribution by social security. Now, if you look at Malawi, when Malawi had the falling inequality, this was a large subsidy like the starter pack in agriculture. And what uh, has kept the inequality low in uh, Ethiopia at, with the Gini at 26% has been, again, uh, agricultural policy, which uh, has been uh, favorable to that. So I, I think is, from a policy perspective, it's very important to separate what is sort of endogenous to what uh, is policy driven. because. If we discover good policy, then we try to replicate. Now, a very quick question to, uh, uh, to Finn. Will, you know, in doing the, our work on Africa, we are a little bit scared because we use WID and uh, we complemented WID. But uh, now the World Bank is doing this uh, re-standardization <coughs> using the microdata. And they will be coming out soon uh, with the new estimates of the Gini. So will uh, we be including these I2D2 new estimates based on re-standardization of uh, microdata? One more question. Yeah, you were the first. Thank you. Um, Andy Sumner from King's College. Uh, my question is a, a kind of normative in a way. Um, I mean, first of all, thanks for a great panel. Uh, I think WIDA should have lifetime funding for 200 years for what it's done on the, the, the WID and inequality work. It's a, a data set that everyone's going to use. And I mean, I, I have it on my on, on almost daily use myself. Um, I think there's, um, there's a slight issue with the, with the SALT data set and the SWID. I'm, I'm judging by your very diplomatic comments that the, the author there didn't enter into a long dialogue and negotiation discussion with you. I suppose there's a worry, of course, that these data sets become... Com as, as as a comment just from uh, Andrea just made about uh, uh, these, these data sets don't become competitors, I guess, and how they can all be put together. So my, 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 my questions are actually more about the kind of uh, the normative questions about inequality, what next, but they relate to a lot of what's been said. The first thing is um, no, no one's responsible for global inequality, but clearly governments are responsible for national inequality. Does that mean national inequality actually trumps global inequality? I'm not saying global inequality doesn't matter, but maybe our focus, there's a normative question, maybe our focus should be national inequality, because that's what someone has responsibility for doing some, something for. The second normative question is really about the measures of inequality and I mean, the, the fact that the, you know, Atkinson's point from the, from the early 70s, 1970, about uh, the measure you choose has normative uh, assumptions embedded in it. Of course, the genie is, is very sensitive or oversensitive in the middle uh, and less sensitive relative to the extremes. And it made me wonder about whether do we need a measure of inequality that, that covers the whole distribution or do we need a measure of inequality uh, that's about the bits of the distribution that are important, i.e. the richest and the poorest, which pushes you more towards uh, ratios. Uh, I'm not going to mention uh, the Palmer ratio. Uh, and the final question is just about redistribution. And I was thinking about this, and one of the, some of the work I've been doing recently is to, to dividing the world up into segments to look at redistributing the growth increment uh, rather than redistribution per se. Um, and uh, what we found is the world could have easily ended $2 poverty already and could probably have ended $4 poverty already with the growth since the Cold War. Uh, if the, the, those on over $30 a day had had slightly less uh, growth of their consumption. So I thought, I wondered whether there's, whether there's anything to say about the redistribution question about focusing on the patterns of, of growth and the growth increment, uh, which 
arguably is politically easier and relates to the inequality of opportunity question uh, than going after uh, a redistribution per se. Thank you. Uh, well, because time, uh, time limit, I would like to uh, invite um, panelists to, to respond first and see if we can do, do some more. Um, would you please start, uh, Dr. Kambo? Yeah, so uh, just very, very quickly, Andrea, yes, I, I, I fully agree, actually. Uh, in fact, if I'd had more time to discuss the, the detail of the Chinese phases, those are very much policy-related uh, uh, phases. And the, one of the reasons why we're seeing this, I believe we're seeing this turnaround, uh, is specifically related to a policy which came in from the mid-2000s onwards uh, under the harmonization label and so on. So now I was, I was, I was trying to give the Kuznets thing purely from the rural-urban population shift uh, point of view, not, uh, although even that is related to, uh, to policy, the HUCO and so on. Yeah, so I wasn't. Uh, uh, on, on climate change and, and inequality, I think, mean, again, very important, very important set of issues. And uh, I tell you, my, my great fear uh, is that the, given the instruments that we currently have, um, the only way, perhaps, the only way we might have of fixing the intertemporal externality, the intertemporal market failure that we, fa that we have, uh, might be on the backs of today's poor. I mean, that's my, that's my great fear. Okay? And you sort of alluded to that in terms of carbon tax and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and we can see that from a standard public economics standpoint. If we, had, if we had sufficient instruments, if we had sufficient lump sum transfer instruments and pricing instruments, we could fix the intertemporal externality and our current distributional thing. My worry is that we're currently focused too much, a, a, a lot, on the intertemporal market failure, intertemporal externality, and we're looking at instruments which do that. <laughs> But those same instruments, one can show, and you alluded to the carbon tax, on, could very well have distributional issues in the current generation. Uh, and therefore, we need, we need more instruments to address that. In the and in fact, it's, it's, it's the transfer instruments, which I think is what we need. Uh, and the $100 billion that's been mentioned in the context of the Copenhagen, uh, of, the, of the Paris uh, uh, agreements and so on, uh, th those are the sorts of things that we should be uh, thinking about. And on, on global inequality, I think, again, very, very interesting normative question. What exactly is the normative import of, of global inequality, per se, compared to uh, within, within country and between country uh, inequality? So we have a thial decomposition, uh, which gives you uh, that uh, global thial and within and between country thial. And we, uh, and we show the graphs, et cetera. But should they be weighted in some way to, to say that actually this is more important then this component, the between or within, is more important than the others. And it depends on what normative framework you have. So if I think of, think of ourselves as being behind a global veil of ignorance, behind a global roles in veil of ignorance, uh, then one might think of global inequality as being the thing, and everything else as being instrumental, simply as a component. The real objective is global inequality. Uh, but of course, <laughs> the alternative, and the main critic of that, of that view was Rawls himself, uh, who argued that, in fact, it's a, it, it, you have to look at the, look at the uh, jurisdiction over which the social contract is actually being uh, uh, negotiated, and that, for all, was the nation state, uh, rather than some putative global government in, in this way. So what normative framework one has matters here a lot uh, in, in, this, in this context. Before I address to Dr. Um, Pintar, I, I have a little question in the extension of this question. That, the reason why we are talking about and concerned about inequality is because increasing inequality within OECD countries, advanced countries mostly. Because we have, you have presented that the inequality global scale in a relative scale has been decreased, while absolute scale has been increasing. And then um, inequality between countries have declined. So is it because advanced countries have a problem while uh, developing countries have less problem? Or inequality itself is, uh, hemp is, is uh, hurting everyone and then we have a global uh, problem on global scale? This is my um, question, not as an economist, but as an as a, um, ordinary person to, to ask. Uh, I just remember that I haven't responded to Ingrid's point about the demographic uh, yeah. change. And I don't really have a, a proper response to it, except to say that there isn't, a single dem there isn't one single global demographic uh, issue. 
so to speak. I mean, you know, we have, in the African context, we have very different demographic patterns uh, compared, to, uh, uh, compared to China, let's say, or compared to other countries. So, uh, uh, and indeed, it's a very OECD perspective that Charles Goodhart is, is putting forward uh, in that, in that uh, context. So that would be my... Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Tan. <clears throat> Thank you very much for uh, a, a very good set of questions and, and, and uh, comments. Now, uh, obviously, we can continue the discussions uh, both over lunch and in the corridors and so on. And I do want to highlight that there is a session tomorrow uh, which continues uh, straight on from uh, our discussion today where the countries I mentioned before are going to be in focus plus the global. Um, I mean, I hope it's clear from what I've been saying. I completely agree with Ravi's last points that, that, that your sort of normative uh, assessment of these things does matter a lot. And this was in many ways a little bit what I was trying to uh, get across. Now, let, let me first say that <clears throat> I'm not against imputation per se. Um, I mean, um, there are situations where it makes a lot of sense uh, to, to try to uh, impute, um, being careful and, and doing it in a, in, in a very sensible way. Um, but a mindless effort where you just plug in an algorithm and then just push the button and then the output of that is put up as if that were the real world. That is what I personally uh, consider to not be particularly uh, careful. Um, but carefully executed uh, imputations where you are trying to account for things where you have a lot of reason to expect uh, that there are issues such as, for example, in the top end of the distribution, I consider that to be absolutely appropriate and very sensible uh, to try to uh, account for that. And one of the challenges and one of the inherent uh, things in this is that I want to convey that this is certainly something that we are in the process uh, of discussing how we can do that. Um, but we are not going to, how can you say, uh, make an adjustment and then go out and saying this is the real world, then we will be very careful in specifying uh, what, for example, has been done uh, to correct for the top end. Now, this uh, leads me also to, to uh, and that relates a, a bit to what Jim was saying, um, there are lots of cases uh, where it jumps straight into one's face that we do not have uh, a global specialized inequality surveys like we have household surveys. I mean, the uh, inequality measures that we have are derived from surveys that are conducted for other purposes. And we should not one single minute forget that. Uh, you could ask the question whether in the midst of discussions around the post-2030 agenda and so on, one should not uh, put that uh, up, that there is that issue that really when we are thinking about and we're trying to measure and so on, whether there isn't uh, actually a need that should be addressed by those uh, who are taking these decisions, rather than just trying to do the best with what we have and, and make adjustments and so on and so forth. Is there a space for a major initiative along the lines of the Living Standard Measurement Service, but on the inequality area? I, I just leave that as a question, but I think it is an important point. And it's an important point because uh, White has actually just uh, con conducted a 16-country uh, um, comparative study of African countries where we have very detailed looked at what some called the uh, Bourguignon Triangle. In other words, try to do the best we could to make growth, inequality, and uh, the last part of it, uh, the consumption growth, to make that, so could we actually come up with a convincing story? And what comes out over and over again is that major developments in food prices and things that are happening at different spaces in the distribution are not caught in our regular household surveys. Now what that means is that we do have to take this challenge serious uh, in, in a very different way, also because this is where we bring the sort of complementary information we, we, we can put together. And we are missing a lot that inequality part of it. Um, so I, I would strongly say that. And for example, just to be very specific, take Tanzania or take Mozambique. The data we have suggests 
limited inequality increases. Now, why? I mean, anybody who knows sort of Tanzania and Mozambique will probably say that inequality has somehow gone up. It's probably buried in, the fa in, in this fact that prices, are, uh, food prices, affect people across the distribution in very different ways than what we actually capture. And a fact such as that people in different parts of distribution are not paying the same price for the same good, well, we often don't capture that. So those kinds of things are looming in the background when we are discussing that. Um, to the chair's discussion about um, sort of the global and, 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 and the national. I mean, obviously, national uh, policymakers are responsible for their countries, and that was sort of, uh, how can you say, the implicit hint that I made when I made a reference to my own government. Um, but it is clear that there is a global set of issues where we need, of course, sometimes to be a little bit careful that we don't take the US and then think that what's happening elsewhere is exactly the same. Um, and, and, and that was uh, the other sort of part of the warning that I tried uh, to leave with you. I think um, that's what I would respond here and now. I, I think there are some people who are not happy with the, their own government, uh, <laughs> including <laughs> Dr. Tarp and then Professor Stiglitz and probably myself too. Uh, now I, w I would like to invite uh, Jukka to, to compliment some Question. Um, very briefly, thank you. Excellent interventions from uh, both on the floor and then by the discussions. Very briefly, just one point that the uh, uh, regarding Ingrid's and 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 and, and Andy Sumner's uh, observations are that the how can we improve the weed? We are very very interested in, in developing it further, and all comments on, on, on along these these lines of of ideas are, are very welcome. So uh, so uh, this is not meant to be the, the final word on this, but the. Uh, for example, how to give even more information would be, would be one, 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 one idea which we, which we need to think about. But thanks, useful, useful comments. Uh, if uh, there are, I think there are some more questions, but I think we have a uh, overrun. So uh, I hope you will continue uh, by group over lunch or individually and continue to contribute. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs>